Hi everyone, my name is Ruth. I am a third year studying maths in Stevenson College um, and yeah, I'm here to welcome you to this week's big question. Um, so today we'll be looking at the question, a relationship with creation, what is God's perspective on the environmental crisis? Um, and in a moment we'll have a short talk from Dave Bookless um, on this question. So Dave Bookless is the Director of Theology at Arusha International, which is a Christian conservation charity, so I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Um, after the talk, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to join a Zoom question and answer session with Dave if you'd like, um, and the details of that will be at the end of the video. Um, so yeah, we'd love to see you there. Um, but for now, let's listen to Dave speak on the environmental crisis and God's perspective on it. It's a privilege to be with you today and to speak on the subject, a relationship with creation, what is God's perspective? And just to introduce myself briefly, my name's Dave Bookless. I'm an environmentalist. I work for a Christian-based conservation organisation, Arosha. Uh, more of that later. Uh, and finally, I have a, a nice connection with Durham in that I have a daughter studying. So shout out to Naomi, to any mathematicians and to anyone from Mildred who's listening. Anyway, back to our subject. Last year, Greta Thunberg memorably said of the whole planet, our house is on fire. And as we look at the situation today, that's pretty close to the mark. COVID-19 is of course a virus that is transferred to humanity from wildlife because of our abuse of nature, because of deforestation and our use of animal products uh, from wildlife. This year has seen some of the worst forest fires on record in Australia and in California and elsewhere. This year has also seen more recorded named hurricanes in the Atlantic and more typhoons in the Pacific than any previous year. We've seen floods, we've seen droughts, we've seen coral bleaching events, the list goes on and on. And of course, we know what the big issues are. We're facing a climate emergency, and it's not surprising that more and more people are taking radical action, getting onto the streets, as they recognize the existential threats to human thriving that this causes. And as we're increasingly realizing, we're seeing a biodiversity crisis globally. In my lifetime, nearly 70% of the world's wildlife populations have disappeared. During this century, up to a million species could become extinct. It just seems unthinkable to me that some of the most beautiful and important and valuable creatures on earth are disappearing and we seem to be doing virtually nothing about it. And the cause of all of these, we know, is our human behaviour. It's humanity's exponentially growing impact, both through population growth, but even more through our growth in consumption. Rich countries consume a vast amount more of the Earth's resources year on year on year, and it is simply unsustainable. So what should our relationship with creation, with nature be? There are various common approaches that have been held throughout history, and perhaps the most popular one of all is that nature is there for people. It's an anthropocentric, a human-centered approach. And you'll notice in the hierarchy on this pyramid that, of course, the man is there above the woman, because sadly, that's, I'm afraid, how hierarchies often work out. They spill over from one area into another. And Christianity has often been accused of being behind this hierarchical anthropocentric view of nature. In a very famous article written in the late 1960s, the American uh, scientific historian Lynn White said that Western Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. And he traced the seeds of environmental destruction to how Christians have interpreted Genesis 1, where humans are described as uniquely made in God's image and where we are given dominion over nature. And that's often been interpreted as being domination. Lynn White's articles become incredibly influential, taught in universities all around the world. What's often not taught is that he concluded the article by saying what's needed is not to throw out Christianity, 
but to rediscover its real roots, to look back into what it really says. His article has also been widely critiqued, and I'm afraid I haven't got time to go into that now, uh, both historically and theologically. But there's certainly plenty of evidence you can find that Christianity has been part of the problem, and we have to recognize that. So the early church father, Oregon, writing in the third century, said the creator then has made everything to serve the rational being and his natural intelligence. And he went on to conjecture that wild and dangerous animals like leopards and bears have been created so as to make humans more brave. And in the Reformation, Calvin in the 16th century wrote the end for which all things were created was that none of the convenience and necessities of life might be wanting to men. It's all there for us, us to use and enjoy and exploit. And today, of course, American politics very recently has seen massive numbers of evangelicals vote for a president who has repealed environmental legislation left, right and centre. It's very easy to see Christianity and the environment as a toxic combination. However, and this is very important, it's not only a Christian worldview that can lead to the destruction of nature. Look at Islamic countries, look at Hindu India, look at atheistic China and formerly Russia, and you'll see that in any society where humanity is put top, where it's believed that the earth is simply there for humans, and a humanist view can do that just as easily as a religious view, then that leads to problems. And actually our world economy and our world political system is based on this. The United Nations talks about ecosystem services, what nature does for us, as if nature is simply there to provide the oxygen and the food and the water and the clothes and the medicines and everything else that we need. The European Union has something called the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. It's putting a price, putting euros and dollars on nature and what it does for human thriving. Here in the UK, the government has its natural capital initiative, which is basically treating nature as a bank that we can draw on and that we need to look after, but simply so that human beings can thrive. It's a capital asset for us. And these worldviews are what are behind our problem today. In a very powerful and honest book, Professor Bill Adams from Cambridge writes that after 10 decades of effort in the conservation movement, the threats to nature are not reduced, but redoubled. The 20th century saw conservation's creation, but nature's decline. And in many ways, the environmental movement has been a failure because it's not been able to tackle the biggest issue of all, which is human nature, human selfishness. That's the ultimate root of the environmental crisis that we're facing. And so many people are proposing a different way of seeing our relationship with nature, one that doesn't put humans at the top. It's an ecocentric view, nature for itself, the intrinsic value of wildlife and other creatures, where humans are just one amongst the many creatures that have to share this earth with no more rights, no more responsibilities than any other. And you can find plenty of evidence to say that this view works. Scientists too often don't care for nature. People don't go into conservation because they see the economic benefits. They go into it because nature is something to delight in because it's beautiful. And if you look at somewhere like this photograph here, you can see that if you remove humans from a landscape, nature often looks after it very well. I don't know if any of you can guess where this photo is. And because we haven't time, I'll tell you. It's actually the demilitarized zone that separates North and South Korea. And simply because it's been kept, humans have been kept out of it for military reasons, nature has thrived and it's become the most important nature reserve on the Korean peninsula. It's a very powerful argument. And one of the most important scientists in the world today, E.O. Wilson, has written in his book, Half Earth, that what we need to do is set aside half the planet's surface area just for nature. After all, today, unbelievably, 96% of the biomass on land is either humans or animals for human use. Only 4% is wildlife. And if we need to change that, then maybe we need to clear humans from half the land surface area, and then nature can actually get on with thriving. 
But in an ecocentric worldview, it's a short step from making space for nature to actually saying that human beings are the problem, that we have become a virus species. And nature, one way or another, is going to get rid of us, whether it's through pandemics or whether it's through other environmental catastrophes. Nature will clear humans out the way. So an ecocentric worldview seems very attractive unless you happen to be a human and recognize that there's something in human nature that really needs fixing. So is there a different view? Apart from the anthropocentric that's saying nature's there for us and the ecocentric that's saying everything matters equally, can the Bible help us navigate this crisis? I believe that it can, and I want to very briefly give an overview of the Bible's big story on this, from Genesis to Revelation. And what we see is that throughout this big story, it's not all about humans, that God cares for everything that God has made. If we look at creation, we find God looking at everything and saying it is all very good. And that's the context in which humans are created in God's image, not to dominate, but to reflect God's character towards their fellow creatures, to be guardians of God's good earth, to serve and preserve. And if you compare Genesis 1 and 2 with other passages about nature, like Job 38 and 39, it's very clear that our role is to be there to care for and enable nature to flourish, not to dominate and destroy it. And of course, very quickly in the biblical account, things go wrong. Humans behave selfishly. And as we're thinking about relationships, sin causes a breakdown in relationship within us, between us and other humans, between us and God, and between us and our environment, the earth and our fellow creatures. Adam, whose name means made from the soil, the Adamar, is told cursed is the ground because of you. And how does God respond to this? Well, in the story of Noah, we find that God responds both to judge and to save. Through the ark, he provides an avenue of rescue, not just for humans, but for every living creature on the earth or representatives of every species. It seems God is interested in biodiversity conservation. And God sends a covenant in the shape of a rainbow, a covenant that's not only with humans, but with the earth and with every living creature on the earth, repeated again and again in Genesis chapter nine. If We move to the third act in the story, the story of Israel. It's about a people and a place. This isn't about Middle Eastern politics. This is about how to live well as a human community in the ecological and geographical location that you're placed in. And many of those obscure Old Testament books are actually about how to look after the land well, how to make it productive, but also to care for both the poor and for other species. And there's this wonderful principle in the Old Testament of shalom. It's a word that means peace, but far more than just the absence of war. It means restored relationships with God, with our neighbors, and with our fellow creatures and the earth. It's a wonderful vision of how things could be. And then of course, right at the heart of the biblical account, we find the coming of Jesus. And the coming of Jesus has so much to say to our environmental crisis today. For one thing, it is God stepping into the created order. It is the creator becoming a creature. The incarnation, God made flesh, and that word flesh is not the word for human, it's the word for a creature. And Jesus, through his life, he uses illustrations from nature. He stills the storm on Lake Galilee. And as we read in the book of Colossians chapter one, he shows himself to be the source of creation, the one by and for whom all things were made, the sustainer of creation, the one in whom all things hold together, and importantly, the saviour, not just of human souls, but of all things in heaven and on earth, who are reconciled to God by Jesus's death and resurrection. And when Jesus rises from the dead, it's the kind of, it's the sign of things to come. It's the first fruits of a tangible renewal of this created order. 
And the Bible has amazing languages, language to, to tell us about what new creation will be like. This isn't about some otherworldly ethereal heaven after we die. Heaven is actually a, a kind of waiting room, a temporary place until the renewal of this creation. As Peter says in Acts 3, heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything. And as Paul says in the book of Romans, creation will be liberated, set free from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. There's this all encompassing vision of the future that one day all things will be put right. There will be harmony within the created order and that doesn't mean we sit back and wait for it to happen. It actually should be a motivation for us to do something to anticipate it positively now. So what's our relationship with creation? Biblically, it's a theocentric one. People within nature. Picture of the heart here, because God so loved the world. And the Greek word that's used in the New Testament is cosmos, which means the same now as it did back then. And humans are there at the bottom of that picture, not because we're the least important, but because what ecologists call a keystone species. We're given special responsibility to uphold and care for and enable the rest of nature to flourish. This is a wonderful picture that addresses both the problem that the human heart needs renewing and the solution that we need to have a better understanding of our place within nature, our relationship within creation. And if you look around the world, you'll see Christians who are responding to this practically. One of my good friends, Catherine Hayhoe, is an American climatologist, one of the top ones in the United States, although she's actually Canadian. And she spends her time trying to persuade conservative American Christians of how important climate change is. Time magazine recognized her of the 100 as her as one of the 100 most significant leaders on the planet. Here in the UK, the Church of England is doing some great work not only in uh, renewing its buildings, it's committed to going uh, towards net zero by 2030, but also in persuading investment bodies in the city of London to pull out of fossil fuels and to improve their environmental impact. And Arosha in its work around the world does this in very practical ways. One of our mottos is writing the gospel in the landscape, working with communities and nature. And whether, top right in this picture, it's in urban multicultural London, taking a piece of council owned land and turning it into allotments and an orchard and a pond and doing environmental education. Whether, bottom left, it's in Ghana, taking one of the most important forests remaining there, Atewa, and leading what's now become a, an international, a global campaign to persuade the Ghanaian government and Chinese investors not to destroy that forest for the bauxite that is under it, but actually to protect it forever for the creatures that are found nowhere else, endemic species, and for the five million people who depend for their water supply on the rivers from that forest. Or whether, bottom right, it's in India, near the mega city of Bangalore, where human elephant conflict has become a huge issue. And Arusha doesn't take sides, but tries to protect the people and the elephants and work out win-win solutions for both. So I really commend to you a Christian understanding of our place in creation. And I want to conclude with four values. Wonder, take delight in nature. Yes, understand it scientifically, but go beyond that. Recognize that there is something miraculous, something special, that there is the attention to detail of a loving creator behind this astonishing biodiversity that we have today. And let that lead you also to empathy with the groaning of creation, with the suffering of our world. Secondly, humility. We need to learn our place, both in terms of our local area and our place in the scale of things. And we need to learn from nature, like this verse here, where the people of Israel are encouraged to learn from migratory birds to understand better how they should respond to God. Thirdly, simplicity. Jesus says an awful lot about this, about not loving God and money, about not storing up too much things, about how hard it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. Have less stuff, but better quality stuff. Make sure that your lifestyle isn't the problem. Detox from materialism. And fourthly, hope. 
something that I think uniquely a Christian understanding of our place can give us. Hope that creation will be renewed one day, that that's a fact of future truth. And today, that means that we can put up with the temporary disappointments as science and politicians and education, all important things, but as they let us down, we recognize that God is committed and therefore we keep at it. And finally, a verse from the Old Testament from the book of Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let's recognize that this is God's world and that we're here to care for it well. I look forward to discussing some of this with you shortly. Fab, well, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it helpful and interesting. Um, if you have any questions off the back of Dave's talk or anything you'd like to discuss further, do head on over to Zoom in a moment um, where you'll have the opportun opportunity to ask Dave your questions um, and yeah, chat through um, any points that his talk has raised. Um, but before you do, um, I'd just like to remind you about the Big Question book delivery service um, that we're running this term. So in the description of this video, there is a form where you can sign up um, your name and address and we will drop in a free copy of Uncover Mark to you. Um, Uncover Mark is a copy of Mark's Gospel alongside some um, questions to help you think through what the Gospel is actually saying um, and the claims it's making about Jesus Christ. Um, Mark's Gospel is one of the four Gospels in the Bible um, and it details the life and ministry of Jesus. Um, so I would definitely recommend getting your hand on a copy of that, um, a copy of that because yeah, it's completely free. Um, so do sign up in the form below. Um, we would love to invite you back to Big Question next week. Um, so normally Big Question happens fortnightly, but seeing as it's nearly the end of term, we will be having the next Big Question next week. Um, and we'll be starting to think about the Christmas story. Um, so hopefully you're excited for Christmas and to get you more in the mood, we've got a Christmas themed big question. Um, and the question we'll be looking at is a Christmas story. How can a baby in a manger go on to restore our relationships with God, ourselves, others and creation? So throughout this term, we've been looking in big question at um, our relationships with God, others, ourselves and creation. And we've seen that none of these relationships are perfect. Um, so how does the Christmas story speak into that um, and how can a baby in a manger fix those relationships? Um, that seems a very strange claim to make, so do come along. Uh, we'll be hearing from Adrian Holloway um, yeah, about how that is the case. Um, so if you're heading on over to Zoom, I will see you in a moment. But if not, take care and have a great rest of the day.